Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are visiting a really cool place while in Tucson. This is Pima. Now Pima, as you know, is uh, associated with a lot of things. So today we're going to be finding out a few of those things as we take a walking tour around the area. Now they do have a museum that has some pretty limited hours. So if you're wanting to come, make sure that you get here early because it's going to take a while to go through this. It's a huge property. And uh, as soon as you get in, you immediately start the fun. So let's go see uh, what the map looks like, what we have to look forward to, and then also uh, talk a little bit more about this. Okay, today we have uh, Aussie Van Man is with us, so he is actually holding our map as we look around. Now, everything in gray is considered to be an indoor hangar space, and then everything outside is the different colors. Now, as we flip the map over, it shows you what all you can expect to find inside the hangars. And as you can see, this is expansive. There are tons of different things here, and uh, we're going to be in for quite a treat today. Now, as we enter in, we learn about the first in flight, which would be the Wright Brothers, and an immediately drops us off to this historic site with a very interesting display above. I'm going to talk to you guys just a little bit, but keep in mind this place is huge so we're just scratching the surface, but I have a lot of fun things to share with you as we do that scratch. Orville and Wilbur Wright were the inventors generally credited with the first practical flying machine. Their famous flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina was on December 17th, 1903, and it's considered the first piloted and controlled powered, sustained, heavier than air flight and despite the Wright brothers claim to the all well-known photograph of the event which is featured here um, there's a there's a few other things that we are going to learn about this for example even though they claim this fame there's a lot of controversy that surrounds it as to the leading up to the actual flight itself so as we're kind of going through here it's showing you how they tested it how they created it and then also some of the different pieces that would have been involved in this first flight but this is just the first part of the first gallery that kind of gives us an introduction to flight from there we learn a lot more about all of the things in this room and um, I'm just gonna be quiet and show you a few of these For example, after we pass the Wright brothers, we learn about engines and there are a variety of different kinds of engines along this wall, introducing us to this much grander room, which you can see behind us with all of these different flying vessels. Now, learning about the engines and how that they've come a long way can kind of tell us why some of these planes might look the way they do or how they're able to carry more or less people. And so it's really nice to see this part as the introduction because then it makes this part behind make a little bit more sense. I really like this one. This one's called the bumblebee and it says world smallest but as you kind of move toward the front you can see where the tiniest of humans would have fit right inside this cockpit right here now, this was considered to be an experimental flight and as you can see it is absolutely awesome looking but it is microscopic like we're talking about the length of this is similar to that of my van maybe okay now the cool thing is as you're kind of going through these galleries you see different kinds of planes from different times but also different places so for example this one right here this one's really neat looking right well if you go around to the side of it you can learn a little bit more about the actual markings and this was a royal air force plane 
but you can also come around to the other side where you can find a sign about the individual plane right here in front of it, which is very nice because that puts all the pieces of the puzzle together so you could learn how much it weighs, how long it was, how big it was, what they would do with it, where it comes from. So it fills in all of those pieces. And so I encourage you guys to, if you are in the Tucson area, come to check this out because again, we're just scratching the surface today by seeing some of the cool stuff because it's so big. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we kind of move outside in just a few minutes. Now the signs that you'll find look like this. Again, they have all of the different details about the weight, the height, the length, and also the service ceiling and things like that. But then you can also see it being used throughout a historic photo and then also the overall like layout of what it would look like. Now this particular piece right here is a Westland Lynx and this is serial number XZ185. It was used by the British Army Air Corps since 2012. So you can see what the markings might look like on one of these as it's being commissioned, but also kind of where the different portions of it are, what kind of size that it is, and uh, then you can kind of compare this to what in your mind you might have thought it would have been like. Ooh, this one's one of my favorites, the Blue Angels. If you've never had the privilege of seeing them fly, it is quite a treat. This is a gorgeous plane right here, and you can see Lieutenant Smokey Tolbert is right there, right under the little hatch there. Now the Blue Angels are a very specific group that have a lot of skill and talent and um, they put on quite a show at air shows. But here you can also learn a little bit more about the plane itself and see again the current markings are the Navy Aerial Demonstration Team which is the Blue Angels and they have been stationed in Pensacola, Florida since 1968. This is another super well-known one. This is U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds right here. This thing is huge. It dwarfs the Blue Angels plane right over there, you can see. And this is why I like displays like this, because you can get a real kind of idea of the size of some of these mammoth planes, and then also kind of what they do through some of the displays. This is really impressive and absolutely beautiful. But again, we're just getting started. You look up and there are planes. You look down and there are planes. There's a stage here where they can do presentations. There's some that make sounds. You can probably hear it in the distance. And um, this is just one display space. This hangar is massive though. Now in this section, they pay special attention to the Vietnam war times and the air strikes and how that they would manage to take over some of these areas. Now here you can find a display screen that shows you a little bit more about what that would have been like, but also they have some relics from the past here, which are really fascinating. So here, for example, you have a piece that is beautiful and amazing and still intact. And this is from the Trang Tigers. This was the 121st Assault Helicopter Company. But then over here, this is actually a nose compartment door panel from a Bell Huey. And this was called the Vikings, also from the 121st right here. Of course, those are only a couple of the displays. They also have some uniforms that were worn, some different mapping things, and some other tools that would have been used during the Vietnam War right along this wall next to the Huey. So not only do you get to learn about the aircraft that was used during that time, but also some of the other things. But again, huge museum. We have a lot to cover here. Let's keep going. Now overhead, we have an aircraft. In fact, if you look directly up, you can see it. The wingspan is only 49 feet and the length is only 20 feet and six inches. And this was designed in Germany in the 1950s. Now, something super cool on this wall right here is all of these are women in flight and highlights throughout history. And it tells you a little bit more about some of the turning points in various portions of the women in flight. And I really like that you can see the various women who have contributed and then also what they have done with the brief synopsis. But there are a few other things over here also that are very interesting interesting, including some NASA contributions and then also something to do with the U.S. Congress. So this is very awesome to see, but we're going to get a little closer and see some of those names. 
This is a big one right here. 1977 U.S. Congress passes a bill recognizing WASP pilots of World War II as military personnel and President Jimmy Carter signs the bill into law. Now why is that a big deal? Well, if you watch a lot of documentaries, you've probably seen the WASP contribution. They would actually fly during a lot of like test maneuvers and things like that and they really were a huge part of World War II in the preparedness for those going overseas and those combat conditions. However, they were never officially recognized. They were considered volunteers and because of that they never received any military benefits whatsoever. So this was a huge turning point for women in the military and I am so happy to have found that of all the little historic facts but this wall right here also super awesome we're gonna go into a few more of these but again I'm leaving some of these for you guys because well you need to come through and get those brain wrinkles and uh, enjoy this space fully by encompassing those facts and then applying them to the things that you're seeing around you in this section, we find women in space with 1983 Sally Ride becoming the first woman in space. And from there, you can follow the timeline to some other amazing, impressive faces. And then here, you find even more impressive women leading all the way up to 2001 when Vernice Armour became the first African-American female pilot in the United States Marine Corps. So often, we hear the stories of the brave men of the military, but we don't hear as many about the women. So I definitely wanted to highlight this. I think this is very important, it's impressive, and it's something that gives us some really great, not only appreciation, but brain wrinkles. So as I continue going through this section over here, I'll just show you a brief pan of some of these, and then we'll get back to some of these planes, because oh my goodness, I see some that I'm just like, pfft. As we move into this section, we learn a little bit more about the Gulf War, which actually went on from August 1990 until February 1991. And on August 2nd, 1990, Iraq invaded the tiny but wealthy nation of Kuwait. And this came to a dispute culmination that ended up having the world watching. And as the world watched on, some of these various outfits were being used during that altercation, including this prisoners of war uniform that was actually issued by the Iraqi military to a captured coalition forces person. In fact, right here, you can see Major Jeffrey Tice in one of those very uniforms. And he was reunited with Major Emmett Tulia and Captain Tom Moray right here in this photo. In fact, during this altercation, you can learn a lot more about the prisoners of war, some of the publications, some of the things that would have happened and also how they might have ended up as prisoners of war. I think this is very important to take time and read some of these things, especially some of these official telegrams that were actually sent right here. In fact, as we know, the real cost of wartime is usually the human expense. And so as we come along here, we get to learn about those humans, those individuals, and we get to envision what it would have been like to not only be a part of this through like the uniform, and the letters and the publications and the reportings, but also see the aircrafts themselves to put the full picture together. And I think that that's why places like this are important because a lot of us will never experience those things. However, we can come to a place like this and learn a little bit more about them so that we can be a little bit more educated when we speak on those things and also take into consideration the feelings of others that have experienced those things and the real traumas that that can cause as well. So as we move through here, I want you to consider what would you do if you were in any of these positions if you were flying if you were shot down if you were taken prisoner what would you do and how would you react it's very important for us to kind of have those conversations especially as regular everyday people now this is a ZPU-4 towed anti-aircraft gun. This was actually a Soviet designed four barreled anti-aircraft gun and it's armed with four air-cooled 14.5 millimeter heavy machine guns that are mounted on a four wheel carriage right here. Okay, so I asked Brock here to help me out with this. So Brock, how tall are you? 
I'm about 6'2". Okay, so you're 6'2". Now, just for context, guys, this is one plane in this hangar. Brock barely is taller than the wheel strut. And it just keeps on going and going and going. But this plane is actually a part of the seaplanes exhibit here. And as you can see, it is large and in charge. This thing is mammoth, guys. It really does put into context how small we are in this big world when you see things like this. Oh, now this is epic. So not only is there a really cool plane behind this, but this is actually a camera that is used. And this is really neat to kind of see how the construction of these is kind of put together. Very different than what you would expect, but you can see like there's a little mirror device in there and everything. Very, very cool. Now we are about to walk under the Blackbird. The Blackbird is huge to say the least. This is a Lockheed Martin product and you can see and hear what this might be like as you move closer to the undercarriage area down here. So let's find out a little bit more about it and then go take a look underneath. This is the SR-71 deceleration parachute, and you can see this is not a small parachute. It has to be big enough to help the plane slow down, and so it's tucked up into a big, huge pile here. But this would be a way that they could slow this guy down, or if they were decelerating in a way that wasn't smart or safe, they could do this also. So that's what it looks like when it's fully in use. Now we're currently looking at a recreation of something called the Bing, which was an officer's lounge for A-10 pilots that were serving in Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom. Inside you would find from 2002 to 2014, there were 34 deployments of A-10s to Afghanistan. And here you would find the deployment plaques along this wall right here. In addition, every time an A-10 pilot would deploy to Afghanistan, they would leave their name tag behind for the wall of the Bing and that's what we're looking at right here many pilots made many deployments and thus they have many different name tags on this wall additionally this is one of those pilots this is lieutenant colonel brown and this is one of his flight suits right here now along the back wall and kind of around the outer walls they have all of these different kinds of displays and these are very fascinating because you get to get a little glimpse into the various aspects of the military including this this was actually a proposed multi-mirror telescope model and they were going to be using telescope mirror glass that would have been in excess of this thick now this is big guys so you would never think of something that would be that thick when it comes to just a telescope but here you get to kind of see the context as to why they would have needed it to be that way and then also what they wanted this to look like and on this model you can see there's a couple of little guys standing there so this thing would have been huge Okay, we moved out of the first gallery and we're moving to the outdoor space. It's a little windy out here. Now, just one thing to note if you are coming here, they ask you to not climb on the planes or touch them or do things like that. So if you are coming out, it's dog friendly. They also allow children, but both of those need to also abide by those rules as well. So um, with that said, we're gonna do some walking. We're gonna stop at a few of these and uh, I can already see this is gonna take a bit because there are a lot of these, but there's also a couple more hangers that we're gonna pop into in and out of so um look at this <laughs> yeah this is cool now guys something else that's kind of cool that they do offer is they do have a tram tour and you can sign up for that you do need to get here early for those though they do fill up pretty quickly it's an additional cost but they stop and tell you a little bit about some of the vantage points and some of the different planes and you can see here they're in the midst of one of their tours Okay, again, there are signs with all of these outdoor ones as well, telling you when they were in use, what they were called, and then also who they are on loan from. This one's actually kind of interesting because it's on loan from the National Naval Aviation Museum, which I've been to one of those. So I wonder if I've seen this one previously. That's pretty cool to be able to see some of these and uh, learn where they came from. This is neat, so neat out here, but there's so many in this line. So let's go exploring.
Okay, as we were walking around, we noticed this hanger back here, but there are two additional hangers that Brock said the last time he was here, he didn't think that they were open. So this is kind of cool to see how they've continued to add to this collection so that you can see even more stuff. Okay, so you said last time you were here, this wasn't opened? Yeah, I definitely haven't been in this hanger before. So this is a treat for so all of us. This is a new experience for me. And when we walked in, so you see this one right here, but but just wait, this is, it takes up so much of the hangar, it's huge. So this is what we were talking about. Do you see as people are kind of walking by how small they look in comparison to the overall size of the plane? And then there's a gunning area right here and the tail fin sticks all the way up to the top of this. And this is not a short structure, this is a massive structure just the tire the tire comes up to about where my shoulder is i again am five six five seven depending on who's measuring me so this is it is very very tall much larger than the other planes we were seeing in the other hangar for sure but again for context look at this i, I barely come up to like this one little bead pattern and that's not even halfway up the side of this this is this is awesome and then on the back of the little tail fin here you see more guns that would be another little place that people would be and um you can kind of get a context for for the size from this angle it looks like a big blue whale it's pretty cool but um it looks like brock is actually going into his structure so so let's see if we can go in there too just a few steps are holding us back from being inside whatever this is i'm very excited about this if you can't tell we're gonna duck in and wow oh this is this is neat this is very neat so this is where people would sit i'm assuming yeah so they would sit and then that's the uh, cockpit area we're going to wall oh interesting okay so can you imagine being in one of these planes? Now this is a smaller plane than some of them, but being here, sitting in this area and flying to your destination with like a whole bunch of other people beside you. Now, I can tell you, this is not very wide. In fact, I wanna say that this particular like area is probably only the size of some of the smaller vans. Like whenever you're looking at how big like it is to put in a regular size bed in a van, it's about that wide across. So this is not a big plane, but at the same time, it's really long. So you'd have a bunch of your buddies with you going to some undisclosed location. Again, put yourself in the perspective whenever you come to the space so you can kind of understand it a little bit better. It's very interesting, but the view of the cockpit is fascinating you can see all the little gadgets and gizmos and just look to see this is how the brainchild of the plane would actually be working and how they would get you from point a to point b very interesting and i like that you can come in here and see that now looking at this little piece of history right here you might be thinking you're looking at one of those little barrel trains but in fact this is one of the trailers for the bomb service truck that would have looked like this and they would have hauled them in series and someone would have been tagging along at the end just to make sure everything was okay this is the first time I've seen one like this with the photos to accompany it so it would make a little bit more sense this is really cool guys and right beside that is another really interesting piece this is the McDonnell LBD number one gargoyle and the current markings that are on it were from 1945 it was a remotely guided rocket that was propelled and it had an anti-shipping glide bomb attached to it that was used during world war ii and so as you're looking at this you can see the scuffs and the the scrapes on it you can see at the very beginning it has that tip very similar to many of the planes but you can also see the differences between the planes and this device right here just to kind of give context as to where this would ride, it would ride directly below the wing. And this is another radar guided glide bomb. This is actually the ASM N2 BAT. And this is a radar guided one. So you can see what that one would look like versus the other. Even though they would be distributed very similarly, this one would have a lot more capabilities based on the radar that they would be able to use. Now this was created by Bell Labs and it's a design that was also used 
used during World War II. It really is impressive how they've merged like the pictures with the actual planes themselves. This is actually from the 110th Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron right here. This was flying in New Guinea in 1944 and this is another Bell product. This was the Area Cobra right here. Now this is very cool. This was Royal Canadian Air Force used and this was from a squadron in 1944 and this is just really cool to see in person. I have not seen anything quite like this. This has a lot of different moving parts to it. I want to show you a few of the interesting pieces that set this one apart from some of the others that we've been looking at. Number one, do you see that bottom right there? That bottom actually can go into the water, which is unlike a lot of the planes that we've been seeing. This one could do a lot of different things. It also has this little post right in the front with a gunner's nest, and right behind that is wherever you actually have your pilot. And inside, it's kind of hard to see, but there is an actual pilot in there kind of to demonstrate what it would have looked like. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of different compartments on this one also that would have little lookouts and this massive wheel right here but in the back there's a huge bubble that would have been used for something I'm not exactly sure what this bubble would have been used for there's no guns popping out of it or anything but it is very interesting then you can see where it comes down and actually goes into the water before hitting that big tailpiece back there this thing is massive and at the same time it has a few really cool features that are just making it just stick out in this room of all of these goliaths now right next to that you can't miss this bright yellow u.s coast guard piece right here this is actually 48 feet of rotor distance 57.2 feet of length and 13 feet high. Now this could reach up to 90 miles per hour. And this was used by the New Orleans Coast Guard Station in 1956. Now before we move on though, I just wanted to come back to this one more time to kind of show you from this angle how big it is. Um, it's big enough that under the wings they could park an entire another plane here and, and you can see it's just it's just huge guys this is another one from 1945 this was a general motors product this is actually called the avenger and it was used by a torpedo squadron one while on the uss bennington now i think this one's pretty neat because as you can see the wings actually fold down and in to take up less room and they're showing us that here in the display so that you could see just how impressive this really is this next one is actually something pretty pretty unique this is a lifeboat that was carried on the underside of the plane do you see it it's right here but in all actuality this is what it looks like it's huge so very big enough to carry numerous people inside and they could drop it down from the plane so that it could safely land in the water using a parachute it would look like this when it was deployed right here now right next to the lifeboat we actually find this 50 caliber browning machine gun and they have a display of what it might have looked like being used but also they have the historical photos here now this would have taken a 50 caliber bullet and then they would have been able to elevate it anywhere between negative 15 to 90 degrees and it could have gone in a 360 pattern so they could use it in a point like this and control all sides from above or below and make sure that they're protecting the horizon now in this section you can find a variety of different uniforms once again and each one of them has a placard below it for example as we move closer to these you can see that they are all from the imperial Japanese army and this is what the uniforms of the time would have looked like but as you're moving around you can find different engagements different groups and also different ranks amongst these uniforms Now, as we enter into this gallery, the first thing that you see is actually a kamikaze plane, and we learn a little bit more about them. Now, this, unlike a lot of the planes, is not restored. It looks pretty original. It's not in the greatest of shape. You can see the patina. You can see all of the dents and dings. But I think that this is really important that we see it in this particular context. But also, 
that we can see many of these historic photos that go along with this. Now, of course, kamikaze attacks were commonplace throughout the war, and there were over 106 kamikaze missions, with a total of 47 Allied ships that were actually destroyed, and 368 which were damaged. But just beyond that, we find the sign for this, and it does have a little bit more information about why exactly it looks the way that it does. And basically, long story short, these were not made to hold up and last. So this particular one, while sitting in storage, began to rot and decay and fall apart. And so they wanted to leave it intact as is so we could see that. And so also we could understand a little bit more about the intentions of, of kamikazes. They weren't meant to be a plane that they could send out numerous times. They were meant to be a one and done, cause a lot of damage, and then be finished. Have you ever seen a fuel pump for a regular vehicle? Well, guess what? This is actually a fuel cell from a P63, and you can see all of the moving parts, and then also a little bit more about the overall size of how big this would have been. Now, guys, this is one of the most interesting views I have had of a plane. You can actually walk under, like right here, and the doors to the bottom of it are open so you can see up inside and inside you see so many interesting things including this bomb so on these skids is where the bombs would have been placed and then they would have been able to deploy them off of each of these and there are four sets of skids in this particular area very neat, very, very neat. But I believe there's another section up here that we can also walk under. In fact, yes, there is. And there are four more of those skids there. Now, just to kind of show you what the plane looks like as a whole, instead of just the underside, you can see it's quite large. And you can see it's called the Sentimental Journey. You can walk under it and see where the landing gear goes up into it and see a few other things also, including some of the ground crew and also the armorers who have listed their names right there on the nose. But a closer look, just in the cockpit, you can see First Lieutenant L.E. Gilbert, and then you can also see several of the bombs that they have dropped right there. Now this engine is politely called Moan, but it is on top of this X606, which is called the Syracuse Shack Rat right here. And this is another big boy in this gallery. Okay, looking at this again, we have made it over the sign. This is actually a Ford General Purpose Willy, and it was a half ton four by four truck. And it's next to this cargo hole right here. And from this angle, you can see a bit more of what would be in there. And it looks like some very interesting supplies that they would have carried with them to kind of stock up this guy. Okay, we moved back outside. And as soon as we did, we were rewarded with so many more awesome looking planes. Now, now we're going past this one that's a flying eye hospital. And I think you can see from this, this is, this is like a standard size, like big plane, like a commercial plane that you would use, but it's been converted into this eye hospital, which is really cool. I've never seen that before, but we're also out here with a lot of other really big planes and some of these look like they have seen some better days and then some of them look like they have had some some renovations so we're going to go check out some of those and see how far in this direction we can come before we have to go back out to the main loop area okay as we moved over to some of these other big boys you can see here that there's actually a qr code on this so i'm really interested to see what if we hover over this it will show us it also gives us of course the information this one's on loan from the u.s forest service and this guy is big okay i hovered over using just my photo section camera of my phone and it's trying to load and it's going to some kind of interesting little address so i'm not sure my signal out here says that it's good, but it's also struggling a bit. So um, I may just have to leave this loading so I can look at it a little bit later.
Okay, while we're here, we are able to see a lot of different planes, but there's also a fence along this way that you're not allowed to go over there, but you can see kind of what is over there. It's like a boneyard of old wrecked out planes, and it's pretty fascinating to kind of see some of them. I'm gonna show you a few of them using my little handy dandy telescoping stick here, so you can kind of see what the difference is on the ones that they've worked on versus the ones that they haven't. Now. I'm assuming that they're going to eventually put these in circulation. I would assume that, but I, I don't know that to be fact. So I want to show you what it looks like over there. It's really cool. This guy behind me is huge, but it actually belongs in this hole up here. In fact, as we kind of move closer, you can see the size. Again, using Brock as a reference, he's an average height man, and yet this thing looks like he is very, very small. And you can see where this piece would fit in to this hole right here. It's really fascinating to be able to see how the decommissioned planes are kind of treated, preserved, and also protected in certain ways. And then in other ways, how they've taken out certain pieces of technology to keep us safe from people coming in here and wanting to steal those things. So it's kind of interesting to get this close to some of these things because in real life land, we would never be able to see one of these whenever it's commissioned because it is protected technology technology. So this is really cool to be able to come out here and just see the expansiveness of all of these big boys out here. As we enter into this building, we find a bunch of the artwork that was taken directly off of some of the planes, and each one of them has a little tiny label like this where you can see the actual plane that it was taken from and learn a little bit more about it. Now, each of these were very individualized to the people who were flying them. They would many times paint these as like a symbol in the air of who they were and who they represented. And a lot of times they had really interesting messages that they would also paint on the missiles that they'd be sending out. So it's cool to be able to see these pieces as we kind of go around, but also there are more impressive pieces in this place again. So every hangar is a little bit different, but very interesting and tons of brain wrinkles in each and every one of them. So again, leave yourself some time. We've been here for already some hours and we only have a couple hours left and we may or may not get to all of the outdoor planes because there's just so many of them. But uh, for the time being, let's take a look around this hangar. And um, guess what guys, we found a bunny. I know, I know. We never thought that we'd find one at the military museum here at Pima, but guess what? We did in fact find Thumper here. And believe it or not, Thumper was all the way back from 1943. Now here we have the world's first operational cruise missile. And this was considered to be one of the wonder weapons of the time. And here you can see how it would have been used. You can also get a closer look at the size and also some of the branding that would have been placed on this particular one. But here we learned a little bit more about the launch site representation that we're seeing in front of us. And this diorama was actually assembled here and is intended to convey the general impression of what it was to launch the V-1 launch site and what it would have been like in the early spring of 1944. Now, in addition, you can also see a drawing of the official V-1 flight bomb and what it would have looked like on the inside, which is very interesting. You can see all of the different details, all of the schematic pieces, where the wires would have been, and this at the time would have been state-of-the-art. Now, having been this my first visit, this feels like a slightly older hangar with some different kinds of things in it than you saw in the other two, which were more recently opened. So it's kind of interesting to see 
how the signage has changed and how they're constantly in an evolution of upgrading here. So at any time that you come and visit, you may see even more than what I'm sharing with you today. And again, we're still just scratching that surface. Behind me, you can see a variety of different kinds of planes, including this guy, which is another flying fortress. Flying fortress was the one that we went into earlier and we could see up inside of. Well, this is what it would have looked like in its original kind of structure. You can see all the paintings on it. They do have a couple of little areas that you can see in to see and visualize what they would have been doing inside, but there's more. Now in this case right here, we actually find a piece of a wreckage of a P-47 and the story of the aircraft itself is right here. This was flown by First Lieutenant Paul Mazel of the 513th Fire Squadron and he was actually shot down by a German flak near the town of World Germany. Now the problem was he wasn't found until August 2005. They couldn't locate this wreckage, but whenever they did, they preserved it and brought it here. This is kind of cool. You can sit here and experience the tactical air command and then also see what it would have been like as you're learning to fly in these conditions. Now, at the time, it was very different than it is now where there were all sorts of really detailed simulators. This would have been a modern simulator at the time. And as you can see, it's just pixels on a screen, basically. We now move into the 390th Memorial Museum, and this is the home of the B-17 Flying Fortress. Now this is pretty neat. They have a mission here, and it says the staff and volunteers work to honor and memorialize the airmen who flew the B-17 bombers into combat, and also the ground crews to support them. And then they execute this every day by educating the public, which we love, about the air war over Europe. And here you can see some of the various planes that were engaged in that, including the I'll Get By the Great McGinty, the Bundles of Trouble, and the Miss You. Now throughout this section you'll find various stations which are marked on the ground through these little tiles and then as you look forward you can find out what that station has to offer in way of education and new brain wrinkles. Like we start off here with the red alert flag and every squadron has an alert flagpole which is strategically placed along the living areas. The flag that looks very similar to this means that they are on alert and a mission is happening. If there is a blue flag it means stand down, no mission is scheduled, and if there is a white one, there's a standby, which means that status is undetermined or pending. In the same section, we find this bicycle, which was actually used by the 390th Bomb Group at the airfield in England during World War II. Now inside section one here, you'll find what the living quarters might have looked like as well as how that they would have had all of their things packed away. They would have had one of these little foot lockers like this and maybe a bag. And then their bedroll would have been all that they were supplied. So whenever they were more set up, it would have looked more like this side over here where individuals would have been able to mark their space, have individual items like radios or even a few hang up, pin up poster kind of things. Now here we learn a little bit more about what it would have been like here. It says that officers lived in huts that housed eight to 12 men. The pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier were two or three of the crew member. The sergeant and the gunners slept on bunk beds in larger huts, which held up to 36 men. If a plane was shot down, then one of these huts would fall silent or empty. Half of its residents could be lost in an instant. And this is what that would have looked like using those historic photos. Now, as we make it to station two, you see before us the Boeing B-17. And on this particular showing area, you'll see this thing is huge. And there's a little ladder, in fact, that Brock was just kind of hanging out in up here. So we could go up for a viewpoint. We just cannot enter inside. Now, in addition to this little hatch that you can get a good look in, you can also come to this section over here and take a look inside into 
the inner workings of the plane itself. Now the prototype for the Boeing B-17 actually launched in 1935 and then it was later implemented into a lot of different engagements within the World War II time. And so you can see why this would be a very important plane and then also how it could have had a lot of different functions that would have been very, very on the hush-hush at the time. They wanted to keep the secrets so that they could do a lot of damage and also make a big mark to, you know, bring home more people versus having more crises. And so here we get a good look at what it would have been like, but also there's some more educational signs because we're at stop two, so let's go check those out. Here we learn that in total, 12,731 of this model were actually produced. They were 103 feet of wingspan and they were a approximately 74.4 feet in length. Now one of the primary functions of this particular plane was to be able to facilitate carrying bombs. And here you see the various stages of bomb storage and then also bomb transportation and bomb handling. In fact, at any given time, you may have had a variety of different kinds of bombs being loaded into this guy and taken up into the skies to put a dent in the enemy. And so here you can find some of the things that would have been just lying around in the hangar as they were preparing these. As we get to station three, there is a large full-size painting of what it would have been like to be in this particular aircraft and all of the different compartments and the people who would have been inside. And some of these positions do not look comfortable at all. Some of them look extremely strained and stressful. For example, here in the front, the man would have to hunker down in order to be able to fire off those front guns. And he would have had to have sat in that position and worked. But then with this section that is like a gun that pops down, you basically would be in the fetal position firing off at this one. Standing room for these sections, but at the very back again, he is on his knees just below that tail fin there in order to fire that rear gun. Of course, you can see each of these positions clearly whenever you look at the larger model itself. And as you do, you can imagine what it would have been like to be a part of that crew. The tail section, this is what it would have looked like. You would have been crouching down with your knees on those pads while your behind was on that seat and operating a gun right there. Now, as we reach the top up here, we learn a little bit more about nose art. And along this wall, you'll find a whole bunch of different, really unique pieces. But there's also a section up here that tells you a little bit more about nose art and what people would do, why they would use certain images, and what it meant to them. Now, this section is pretty interesting because it's about jacket art, which is something that was officially forbidden after a 1943 incident which is detailed right here. Now this incident details that three different people actually put Murder Incorporated on their jackets and they were taken hostage, they were taken prisoner. And this led to some really bad things. So it kind of filtered in from the top down that this would no longer be tolerated and so we don't see this anymore. So these jackets are even more important as a part of history because there's something that you can't do anymore. And so they have a little collection here. But they also have a sign that says if you have a piece that you could potentially donate to this collection, they would be so excited to put it on display because it is such a relic from the past. So we're gonna go check out a few of these and you can kind of see what these would be. And um, maybe it'll give you a little bit more context as to why this was such a big, huge deal whenever they said no more. Now in this display case, we learned that most of this art was added after World War II. This was the jacket of Kenneth Wolfert. And you can see here the various designs on the back of the jacket. Each bomb actually signifies one mission that was completed. He actually completed 21 missions with the 390th. Now again, there's a little bit of a glare, but you can see this one was Merle Childress. And you can see here that there are 26 bombs for 26 completed missions on this one. And again, those are only a couple of them. It is a little bit harder to film this area because of the reflection, but some of these are really amazing. The art is beautiful and spectacular, but there's only a few of these here. So it's definitely a cool piece to see. 
Not to mention from above you get that overhead view of the I'll be around and you can see just how big it is. All the little people around it look kind of like little ants. Here's an interesting tie to another adventure. Walt Disney made a rule forbidding Mickey Mouse's appearance to be on combat units patches. Even though Walt Disney did participate in the war efforts by creating cartoons to bolster patriotism. Okay guys, I did go ahead and finish up in there and I picked up the POW video because I wanna have a chance to watch the entirety of it. It's a very detailed video and again, I. I definitely encourage you guys to check it out. If you get here earlier in the day, make this one of your first stops because the information inside of this will set the tone for some of these other places as well. I definitely appreciated it. But we have a little bit longer, so I'm gonna go around the outside of the field, show you guys a few more of these super impressive planes that are out here, and uh, see if we can find the one that I saw whenever I drove in. It was my absolute favorite. It's really cool looking, but um, I think it's kind of toward this direction. I'm not sure, but we're gonna go find it. Okay, this one guys is on loan from the US Air Force Museum right here And this is called a quail. It's tiny but interesting definitely and this one has a uh, Decoy missile. That's what it's called right here a decoy missile But it's next to something that I could see from a distance away the Lone Star Lady which definitely appealed to me as a fellow Texan although I was told that this one is actually being repainted and it used to be all like this green color that you can see on the top just barely now. It's pretty cool. Now the Lone Star Lady is actually decommissioned and she was in 1983 but she ran from 1956 to 1983 as you could see and it's on loan from the National Museum of the United States Air Force so another big huge addition to this collection right here but we're just in the beginning of what I will call big boy row right now now Brock's been here before and he told me that there is a row of presidential planes so I'm trying to get to that and we're running out of time we've been here for hours guys and uh, even with all the hours that we spend here I don't feel like we have enough time there's just so many to take in and if you stop and you just admire them and their beauty and their wonder and think of their stories <sighs> one day is just not enough oh I can definitely see why this is the beginning of the big boys like look at these these are huge they have Royal Air Force US Air Force they have a Go Army plane over there. And just beyond that, that's where we found the presidential planes. We're working our way over there. I also see toward the very back of the property, another fence with all of the military vehicles. Now I am assuming that those will be in the military vehicle museum once that part opens. And by the looks of it, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of them. So um, I can only imagine it's going to be a large hangar with tons of cool information and even more brain wrinkles. But what is this guy? Oh, you know, just, just huge, just huge. I can't find the sign for this one though. Oh my goodness guys, it's a NASA plane. I have to find the sign for this. This is impressive. This is huge. This is awesome. And it's NASA. But this doesn't look like it's the only NASA plane. In fact, this is just one of the NASA planes. There's another one right in front of me, followed by a Coast Guard. And it's something I've never seen before that I'm super intrigued by, so, so I have to get closer. Now, believe it or not, this behemoth that kind of looks like a humpback whale is actually another NASA plane. I've never seen anything that looks like this. It looks like it's tacked together and created into this like weird concoction of strangeness. I, I don't know how to explain it exactly. It's just very strange. We have to go find out more. And I think Brock just found the sign. Okay, here it is. This is the Aero Space Lines B377SG, and this is called the Super Guppy, and it's a cargo transport plane that was used between 1965 and 1995. There's Brock. Did we find it? Did we find President's Row? 
I think we did, I think we did, yay! In fact, we did. This actually served in the presidential fleet between 1955 and 1970, right here. But this one, this one is the one we were looking for, right here, this plane. This is where we get to see some of the who's who of the United States. This was not a presidential plane, but it was used by some of the VIPs. So this could have been state senators. This could have been people who were ambassadors. This could have been foreign dignitaries. This could have been a lot of people on this plane, but they were all representing our country. And so it's really cool to be able to see this particular plane before we see the next one. And just to kind of give you a little bit more insight, this was a Boeing VC-137B VIP transport called Freedom One. We've heard of Freedom One. This one was actually delivered to the United States Air Force on May 31st, 1959. The plane that we're currently looking at was the presidential aircraft Air Force One that was used by both Presidents Kennedy and also Johnson between 1961 and 1967. This is on loan from the National Museum of the United States Air Force as well. Okay, that's gonna do it for us here at Pima. I've had a wonderful time sharing this with you guys. If you've enjoyed coming along, make sure that you leave a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button. And if you've ever checked out places like this, let me know. I'd be glad to hear what kind of museums that you would like me to go to in the future because I always enjoy a good brain wrinkle and I hope you do too. Till next time guys, bye.